Hello, Malcolm Brady from Dublin City University here with you again today. I'm going to talk about the um, ValueNet competition um, competitors, stakeholders, and then on to yeah, SWOT analysis and strategic issues. So quite a bit uh, to look at today. I won't be spending very long on each technique, so it'll be an introduction to each of the techniques. And these techniques are all part of the analysis phase of strategy making. Okay, so and mo they're largely all internal analysis. It's centered, well, it's it's with the firm as the center of the analysis, as opposed to the industry as the center of the analysis. So I'll start with um, Brandon Berger and Neil Buff's uh, value net. And you'll see straight away that this looks very like Michael Porter's five forces framework. And some of the terms even overlap with his work. But this technique here is centered on the firm itself, not on the industry. Porter's uh, customers and so on, where in customers for the industry as a whole, whereas customers in this instance here is are the customers of the specific firm you're looking at. So who are their customers? All right, they may be, obviously they're industry customers, but they may be a niche or whatever within that industry. So you have to identify who are those customers. Obviously in the center piece there, the company itself is the firm you're looking at or the organization you're looking at. Suppliers are their particular suppliers. So in Five Forces, you look at suppliers in general to the industry. Here you're looking at the specific suppliers who actually are the suppliers, the specific firms that are your main suppliers. Substitutors then are, they cover Porter's substitute phrase as in, any products or firms, products or firms that could substitute for your own company's products, but also your competitors. Uh, Porter uses it, doesn't include competitors under substitutes. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. But here we're including competitors. So who are your specific competitors within the industry? We looked at strategic groups already, and in, in a sense, they could be competitors for your firm. Yeah, you may have already identified them in that technique. And the final technique in the addition of one here are complements or complementers. These are firms or other agencies, firms, organizations that complement your activities. In other words, when their activity goes up, your activity tends to go up as well. When their sales go up, your sales go up. Or when your sales go up, their sales go up. So you're, you're working in tandem. Whereas with competitors, generally speaking, if your sales go up, their sales go down. If you're in a perfectly competitive world, okay? What you gain, they lose, okay? Um, <clears throat> but complementers allow you both gain. And Brandenburger and Nailbuff both coined this phrase in their book, Coopetition. They, they coined the phrase Coopetition, which means, which and the concept they're getting at there is that even among competitors, it's not always um, uh, zero sum competition. Often there are gains for both firms out of the competitive process. So um, complementers in that case could be actually firms within the industry itself. They, they could be other competitors. For example, um, in, a, um, in a retail mall, uh, the firms collectively will compete against other malls to get customers to come to that particular mall. So they're complementing each other there in that aspect of their um, business. But once, they, once a customer gets into the mall, then obviously they're competing very strongly for the customer's wallet within the mall. Okay, so they, they, they cooperate to get customers there to that particular mall and then they compete within that. Again, you'll notice often that particular crossroads, uh, all the handbag companies in the city, all, uh, all the retailers of handbags congregate around a particular corner, or all the pipe manufacturers congregate around another corner, or all of the scarf manufacturers or the retailers congregate around another corner. What they're doing that you wonder why is that happening but in fact they're using they're 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 doing that because that corner then becomes synonymous with handkerchiefs or scarves or gloves or whatever it is and then once customers come to that corner or that area of the of the city once they're there then the various firms will compete for that particular customer's attention but they collectively create an image of that area being attractive or being an area that you can in which you can buy gloves so in that sense they compete but they cooperate as well. And that's the concept they're getting across. Brandenburger and, and Nailbuff are both game theorists. So they look on um, the, the concept of zero sum and non-zero sum gain and the notion of um, <coughs> decisions being independently made by the different firms, but the outcome of the decisions uh, depends, uh, so the outcome depends on the collective set of decisions made. So they're looking at those kind of issues and they came up with this particular concept and this particular framework. So it's a useful framework, as I say, it's, it's firm centric. It's the company is the, the organization you're looking at, customers and suppliers are to do with that firm. 
whereas the Porter's model is to do with the industry as a whole and you're looking at customers collectively or buyers collectively, suppliers collectively. Okay, so this is firm centric. Now, we talked about competitors there already. So actually you can carry out a competitor analysis where you look at each particular competitor or your main competitor in any case, and you identify what, what it is they're trying to do. So this is from Porter's work, his competitive strategy book has a chapter on competitor analysis. And it, it again is a kind of Cinderella technique. You don't uh, see it referenced much, but it makes a lot of sense for a firm to work out what its competitors are trying to do. So you can identify or you can attempt to identify their current strategy. And you may recall in an earlier session, we talked about strategy can be viewed as a pattern of decisions from the past. And you infer from that set of decisions a pattern, and that pattern is in is the de facto strategy of the organization. So you can kind of work it out from their past set of decisions. And similarly, you may be able to work out the assumptions under which they're working from again those set of decisions are their actions, the actions they take, and the way they the way they manage the market. And similarly, capabilities, although we talked about it being difficult to infer or to work out capabilities in a previous session. But having said that, you may still may be able to work on what are their key capabilities and what their and the goals may be, may be out there on their public record, on their website or whatever, so they may be available to you. But essentially, you can put together quite a deal of information sometimes about a competitor and work out then um, from that where, you know, where they're going, what their aims are, and who may, who may be the serious competitors to deal with into the, into the future, and what should you do? What are the implications for your firm and what should you do? So it's worthwhile carrying out that kind of competitor analysis. And uh, previously we talked about a competitor, um, uh, again, a form of competitor analysis where you can rate each of the competitors against, uh, say, the key success factors in the industry and rate your own organization and work out, you know, in a sense where you stand vis-a-vis -vis certain competitors. And again, we've talked about strategic groups already, whereby you can get some information as to which are the which is the group in, within which you, your firm competes and who are the competitors within that group that you compete directly with. So all of this is part of competitor analysis. So <clears throat> um, stakeholders, we talked about complementary complementers a few minutes ago, and um, we can expand that to stakeholders. In other words, all other organizations or um, agencies that may be involved or may have a a bearing on your organization, your firm. This is particularly true of public sector and not-for-profit and charities and so on, uh, all of those kinds of organizations, because they're very much influenced by various stakeholders and possibly a broader range of stakeholders than commercial firms or business firms are subject to. So stakeholder analysis can be a very useful analysis for um, public sector and not-for-profits uh, and other charity type organizations. So this is one particular tool to use, the, the power interest matrix. And you can see it's very simple here. There are two dimensions, power on the one hand, measured from low to high, power over the firm, and interest in the firm, again, measured low to high. And that gives you the usual four quadrants. And each of these quadrants has been given a label from minimal effort to key players to keep informed and keep satisfied. These are the labels for the quadrants. But essentially, you, you, the idea is that you, you rate each of your stakeholders, you identify your stakeholders initially and then rate them on these dimensions and then see which quadrant they fall into. And that gives you a sense of what you should do with them. The, the labels there in the quadrants indicates your strategy with respect to the stakeholders. So the key players are telling you that they're the ones you really need to keep in touch with um, because they will have influence and uh, interest on, in your organization. Whereas the minimal effort, again, implies just possibly just keeping in touch with, but not much more. Okay, so different stakeholders require different levels of um, effort on your part. <clears throat> they also mentioned at the very bottom there, the identify facilitators and blockers. So again, it's worthwhile identifying which stakeholders may be um, inclined to support your actions and support your activities, and which ones may be threatened by your actions and your activities and may be inclined to block what you do. So it's worth identifying those. This. Um, uh, brings to mind uh, one of the change uh, management techniques, force field analysis, which is similar to that again. What, what are the forces pushing for change and what are the forces um, preventing change? So the blockers obviously would be a force preventing you moving forward. Okay, so that's the uh, stakeholder mapping. Um, the next slide really just points out the importance of stakeholders, the increasing level of importance of stakeholders, uh, even uh, with respect to business firms. This is a statement from the um, 
Business Roundtable in the US just over a year ago, made just over a year ago, where they moved from the primacy of sh uh, shareholder value to uh, including this commitment to all shareholders. Now, this is a major change for US corporations who are in, imbued in the um, in the philosophy of shareholder, maximizing shareholder values. But this is actually a move from that saying that actually there are other stakeholders involved who are, that are relevant to business firms and we must take their views into account and we must satisfy those as well. So this is a big change. Now, this is a major round table, uh, some heavy hitters on this round table, chief executives from Apple, Pepsi, Walmart. <clears throat> but they're coming together because they're, they're perceiving the uh, public being becoming more and more skeptical of big business and they felt something has to be done so they broke from this decade of decades of long held orthodoxy orthodoxy of the um, maximizing shareholder value being the purpose of the corporation so they said now that you need to invest in employees you need to protect the environment you need to deal fairly and ethically with suppliers so they're increasing it to employees suppliers and the environment more generally as a stakeholder or the public more generally as a stakeholder so that's, that's a major change. <clears throat> However, not everybody is in agreement with this. You can read an article there by uh, Gregory Mankey in the um, New York Times. Uh, there's a link on the slide to that article where he says that in fact, uh, it's all very well and he's not disagreeing with the importance of stakeholders. Um, but he does say in that article that um, it shouldn't be CEOs who are um, custodians of stakeholder values. It, it should be public sector uh, employees or public servants who are the custodians of shareholder of stakeholder value. And he says that for two reasons. Um, uh, CEOs re are, are put in a difficult position if they're to try and meet uh, the needs of all stakeholders when they're making a business decision. And it can detract from the actual business nature of the decision itself. So for example, closing down a plant. From a business point of view, you might just look at costs and benefits. And if it um, makes more business sense um, uh, in pure economic terms to close that plant down and um, move it offshore or whatever, um, that's a fairly straight, you know, relatively straightforward decision. Not that straightforward, but more straightforward than if you take all the stakeholders into, into account, as in what you do with the employees who were employed in that plant in that say, small town in Arkansas or whatever, and uh, all the suppliers of coffee and uh, furniture and whatever, uh, all the various local suppliers are all going to be affected by that closure. So how do you measure all of that? How do you take all of that into account? It makes it difficult for business leaders. And then he also argues that business leaders can't be measured on, uh, can't be easily measured on um, their performance in terms of meeting uh, stakeholder needs, whereas they can be easily enough measured on the um, on their performance as uh, in terms of maximizing shareholder value because there are shares and they have a price or there are profits and they have a value and you can measure CEOs on that so he argues it's not for it's not best uh, he doesn't advocate putting CEOs in charge of maximizing stakeholder or in terms of looking after stakeholders in general but he does say it's very important and that we should um, but and public servants are um, voted in to or employed to look after that um, purpose. Finally, we come to the SWOT analysis, and that's really looking at um, it, it's taking the firm as a whole into account. Now we've looked at we've analysed the firm under all sorts of headings: resources, activities, uh, stakeholders, um, <clears throat> uh, costs, and so on. And um, we would have done a financial analysis as well if the financial figures were available. So we now have a fairly good understanding of the detail of the firm. So now we're putting it all together under this form of SWOT analysis, which is probably the most well-known technique uh, in strategic management. Um, largely, it's, it, while it's an analytical technique, uh, it's, it's in many ways a creative technique as well, as it's often carried out in a creative type fashion through some form of brainstorming session where you, a group of people of various different backgrounds within the organization, possibly even without, um, or outside the organization, um, come together and brainstorm out the SWOT analysis. So it's um, creative in the sense that um, you get a diverse range of strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats coming out. And that's the first part of the creative technique and the brainstorming technique. But, but it's important not to leave it there, not to simply just generate a list of 20 strengths, a list of 20 opportunities and so on, and just leave it at that, which a lot of SWOT analysis are left out. 
it's important to put in uh, put into divergent part of the creative technique as well. And sorry, the convergent part, um, and narrow those strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, opportunities, and threats down to a narrower number that you can really concentrate on. So it's combining up some that are similar under, uh, say, a, a, um, a group heading or whatever. Um, <clears throat> like if you have 20 items, you don't have 20 different things. You might have like eight or six different things. And each thing each, uh, each thing has three or four sub-elements. So it's worth doing that kind of consolidation work and identifying where the real strengths are, the real weaknesses and so on, real opportunities and real threats. <clears throat> Obviously, you can also take into account your previous, I mentioned if you've carried out that previous analysis, you'll be using that previous analysis to um, generate the, the elements here, particularly the pest anal pestle analysis. That's done as a broad brush analysis, if you remember, on that macro level. Now you take the trends you've identified or the elements of the, you know, political, economic, social, technical, legal, environmental, all those elements and trends that you've identified in that analysis. Now you see whether they're an opportunity for your firm or indeed a threat for your firm. Some, uh, for example, COVID-19 has been a huge opportunity for many, many firms, tech, tech, technical, technology firms, pharmaceutical firms have done very well out of it. And um, obviously for others, if you're in the tourist industry, if you're in the um, airline industry, it has been a total disaster. Okay, it's been a total threat. So something happening out there uh, under your that you've gathered under your pestle analysis can be either a threat or an opportunity or neutral to the firm. So you need to look at these things and identify what are the implications for your particular firm. Okay. And then finally, the last element then is to identify from all of that analysis, what are the critical issues to deal with? So you're going to look at a small number of critical issues. You can't deal with 20 or 40 or 100 critical issues. And obviously in any organization, there's probably, you know, there are thousands of issues out there. So you need to, the senior management team need to identify what are the really, the small number of critical things we need to do. And they may come out of that SWOT analysis. Um, issues don't have to be negative in nature. Uh, for example, an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to, to deal with, for if you're a Zoom, for example, how to deal with the huge expanse, expansion in, in sales. That can be a, a huge opportunity, but it can be an issue as well as to how do you manage, how do you scale up to deal with that, okay? So, you know, the, the issues can be to, under opportunities, they can be under threats, they can be to do with strengths, what do we do with all this cash we have or whatever it is. Um, so you need to identify those, but reduce it to a relatively small number that you concentrate on. Um, clearly, clearly, you must thoroughly understand the issues. Hopefully you will have done that because you've carried out a huge uh, uh, wedge of analysis at this stage. So you should really, you should be in a position to understand the issues. And they're the basis for crafting strategy into the future, dealing with that, those half dozen major issues or what your strategy is really going to do for the next, for the, the certainly the near term anyway, and depending on the issue, possibly the long term. And then obviously you have to decide if tweaking is sufficient to deal with the set of issues you have or if some major overhaul is required. And so again, that's, that's really a judgment call on the part of the senior management team in the organization. <clears throat> okay, all right, I'm going to leave it to that. Thank you very much for listening.